it's so iconic. I, I don't think there's another car that can be compared to it. Hi everybody and welcome to Center Lane. I'm Bruce Hitchin. Today we're in Scottsdale, Arizona and I'm here with Dennis Keir. Now Dennis has this gorgeous DeLorean. Uh, his uncle bought it brand new back in 1983 and uh, Dennis has had it for a few years now. So Dennis, I thought maybe you could just tell me how did you come about owning this DeLorean? Well, my uncle was thinking about uh, getting use, using it as a trade-in on a Tesla. He told me he was going to trade the DeLorean and two other cars that he had in on a Tesla. He had already spoken to the Tesla people, and they said, yeah, they would definitely do that. But I thought, started thinking about it, and the more and more I thought about it, it was such a special car, and knowing this from my uncle made it even more special in the fact that I know it was well taken care of. And so I suggested to him, I said, why don't you sell it to me and keep it in the family? And he just drew back like, wow, oh, you would really be interested in it? And he was just amazed. And so from that point on, we were very excited about it. And then down the road a little bit further, we made the, the transition for it. And I'm so glad he did. He got it in LA um, in 83. But of course, it was made in, in uh, Belfast, Ireland, where they all, they all were made there. For 81, 82, and 83, it was going to be under 9,000 cars were made. That's all for all three years. So even today, there's about 6,700 of them, and we, and we can track them, every one of them, which is really nice. You know, the car was so unique at that time. It was the third year of the DeLorean, the 83 was, and it had a lot of excitement about it, around it, and also around that time, it was very interesting. In the year of 83, um, they didn't have any Corvette at that time. Right. So I have a feeling that that might have made more interest on the DeLorean. After he drove it for a while, and even his wife drove it as a uh, daily driver, uh, they decided to put it in storage for a while, and which they did. And, and then uh, or they left it there for about 25 years, I think. And that's when I, when I ended up acquiring it. What kind of condition was it in when you got it? It was pretty much the, the exterior, as you can see, is just impeccable. Yeah. There were no dents and dings or scratches, uh, and it was in great shape. He had it covered all the time where it was being stored, and the interior as well was beautifully. Uh, we just need to work on the engine and the, the drivetrain and so forth, which we did. And I found a really wonderful guy here locally, Ethan Rohde, who helped me with the restoration. And Ethan has been in love with uh, DeLoreans ever since he was six years old. DeLoreans have always been a passion for me. Really, the car—it's really the car that turned me into a car guy. Uh, I've really been interested in them since I was a kid. I saw in a magazine a picture spread of a DeLorean, and then later on I saw Back to the Future, and that movie really captured my imagination. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. So when I had a chance to buy my own uh, about three and a half years ago, it was, it was a dream come true for me. And uh, I still pinch myself every time I come out of the garage. And oh, there's there's a DeLorean out here. Oh, there's several DeLoreans out here. <laughs> Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? I was in the automotive business for about seven or eight years, and during that time I was working on mostly European stuff, Porsches, Volkswagens, Audis, uh, Volvos, and the great thing about a, the, I don't know if it's a great thing about a DeLorean, but the reality with the DeLorean is that it's, in some ways it's a parts bin car. We've got parts from Bosch, who's a giant German manufacturer. We've got a lot of 
English parts in there. We've got a lot of European engineering philosophies. So for me, there was a lot of common ground between what I already knew and what the DeLorean required, um, mostly in the fuel system. The fuel system is, a, uh, is known as CIS or K-Jetronic. And um, that's one thing that I feel like scares a lot of people away, especially modern mechanics, uh, because it's an antiquated system that not many people work on, uh, are comfortable working on. And it's something that I had a leg up on. We've got to remember that DeLorean had a very limited budget when they were building this car. So uh, things like the engine and transmission were ready made. They were something that had already been developed and proven and really was just tweaked for DeLorean's application and then put into the car. The frame and the suspension are um, are very, very similar to Lotus parts of the time. Uh, they were developed by Lotus and then made by GKN. The interior of the car is very similar to a Lotus Esprit of that era. It is a parts bin special in some ways, but in a lot of ways, it's its its, its own thing. Being rear-engined, uh, the stainless steel panels, of course, um, and just the final styling. Peugeot and Renault were looking to develop a V8 engine, an all aluminum V8 engine. And at that point, restrictions put in place limiting the uh, displacement of engines uh, to a certain tax bracket. If the, an engine was over a certain displacement, it would be taxed heavily. So they decided to change their aluminum V8 into a V6. Volvo was looking to develop a V6 at this point too, and Volvo jumped into the mix and they developed this engine that's in the DeLorean, which is we refer to as the PRV Peugeot Renault Volvo engine. It's an all aluminum alloy uh, V6 single overhead cam. Uh, in this instance, it's a 12 valve engine, so two valves per cylinder. Bill Collins, who was chief engineer of the DeLorean at the time, had contacts at Renault, and they ended up making a deal with Renault to use this engine uh, the factory had excess production capability, so it was really a great solution for DeLorean because they really didn't have to develop their own uh, power plant, they didn't have to develop their own drivetrain. It's mated to a five-speed Renault transaxle, so this is a transaxle where the gears and differential are all in the same case, uh, like you'd find in a Volkswagen, uh, Volkswagen bug or bus. This is a five-speed, yeah, like you said, five-speed uh, transaxle. It's known as a Renault UN1. But it's a very strong gearbox. The engine and, and transaxle in this car are pretty stout units. Like they're, they, um, it's, it's not usually that, you know, serious engine problems that takes these cars down. It's fuel system problems. Dennis's car was uh, really the first DeLorean that I had touched other than my own. And Dennis's car, as he probably told you, had been sitting uh, for several years in his uncle's garage. When I went to go see it, uh, the car was running, but it was running very poorly. So I knew we were probably looking at some fuel system issues at, at a minimum. Uh, once we got in there, uh, it was apparent that the fuel system needed uh, some pretty serious work. Um, it had been kind of bodged together to run, but it wasn't running well, it wasn't running correctly. He pulled the engine out, took tore it apart, and looked at everything. And Ethan is just a, such a fabulous uh, person as far as his knowledge of the, the uh, DeLorean and his capabilities as well. We replaced all the injectors. We had the uh, fuel distributor rebuilt and the warm-up regulator re rebuilt. So these are the core pieces of the fuel injection system. I took the engine out to reseal it. It leaked oil pretty bad. And while we were in there, we discovered that it had a really bad sludge problem. So the heads came off to go get blasted and rebuilt. And the engine basically came apart to get cleaned out. And uh, we did a few just kind of basic maintenance things to, to get this thing to be as close to new as possible. Uh, there were a few electrical upgrades that we did. We went through the front end rear suspension uh, with new bushings up front. Uh, new shocks all the way around. Uh, my goodness, we did a lot to Dennis's car, and I, I'm really pleased with how that car turned out. It's probably one of the most comfortable DeLoreans that I've ridden, and it's a beautiful example of a late model car. Well, basically what I said to uh, Ethan, Rody, I want to do this right. 
and if something needs to be replaced, we need to replace it. I don't want to fix it to run and then as it breaks down, then fix it to run and continue that pattern. I want to fix it right, and so we did. So anything that was in question, we fixed. Uh, the uh, binnacle had to be completely remade. Uh, we had that done up in San Francisco, and a few other little details, but basically he had taken such good care of it, there wasn't too much cosmetically that had to be, had to be done. I got the car, I've been having a kick driving it, it's a lot of fun, and uh, so the car's name is Neil, after my uncle. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. My, my advice to anyone looking for a DeLorean is get an education, understand the, the common faults that we see in these cars, the common failures, and um, just be prepared because there's new ones. We're seeing new kind of pattern failures uh, at this point, 40 years down the road. There's a, a DeLorean club in each major city, each major state in America. And in Arizona, perhaps, where I live, there are about 20 members and about almost 20 cars. We did a, a ride recently where we took nine of, them, uh, nine of us together, went up to Wickenburg, Arizona, and had a great, a great time. And we got a lot of looks. When I drive it, people always want to stop and talk to me about it and tell me something about that they've never seen one before. And a lot of people have never seen one on the streets before, which is really interesting. So it gets a lot of attention. I love DeLoreans because uh, it's one of those things that you can drive around in your uh, weird little 80s kind of bastard of a car. And uh, first of all, it's fun to drive. It's very rewarding to drive. And the second is the people who see it and know what it is, man, you just see them light up. It's really funny. You'll be driving and you'll get honked at. You'll get waves and thumbs up. It was my uncle's and it meant a lot to him. That was, that was a big part of it. And the other thing is, it's so iconic. I, I don't think there's another car that can be compared to it in terms of the imagery that it has and everybody immediately thinks of Back to the Future and, and have some story to tell. And especially, in a, it hits all generations too. Um, it's one of those things where just by driving around in your car, you can kind of bring some sunshine to someone's day. And uh, I think sharing the car with people is one of my favorite things about owning a DeLorean. It's really a piece of history. Uh, John DeLorean was a total maverick. He was a, a brilliant, uh, arrogant guy. And to decide, well, I'm going to go at the top of his game. I'm going to I'm going to start start my own car company. I mean, what a what a bold move. But he did it at a time where people just weren't doing that. And so the the history behind the car is is still fascinating to me. Now having the, the real thing in the palm of my hands and, and being surrounded by all these cars is a real treat for me. I want to kind of honor John's, John's legacy and um, keep, keep his dream alive.